All right. I think I'm bringing up the rear, so uh, I'll be brief, which has never happened before, but there's a first for everything. So who here tonight is excited about slavery? Oh. Slavery. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Tough crowd. Who here tonight is for slavery? Condone slavery? No. Who here tonight is for the death penalty? Oh, a lot of hands are going up. Okay. You know, these are both a part of God's righteous and holy law, right? They are both a part of God's righteous and holy law. But everybody's okay with the death penalty, but not slavery. All right. So, a lot of Bible critics will come at us, Christians, and they'll say, your Bible condones slavery. It's a wicked book. How could you read and believe something that promotes something so wicked and heinous as slavery? You know what I say? Bring it on. That is exactly right. It does condone Slavery. Why? Well, let's get into it. Let's, before we cast judgment at God's perfect and holy righteous law, let's try to understand it. And here's the thing, guys. If the Bible says something is right, it's right. Whether you do agree or not, it's right. Okay? We do not stand in judgment of God. Okay? We... We can try to better understand him, and that's what we're going to do right now. Let's go to Exodus chapter 21, Exodus chapter 21 in your Bibles, and the title of my sermon tonight is Biblical Slavery, Biblical, Biblical Slavery. It is in Exodus chapter 21, verse 1, the Bible reads, and I'll try to be brief. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them, if thou buy an Hebrew servant. Six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall, shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she hath borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the door of post, and his master shall bore his, his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So every time I see a man walk around with an earring in his ear, I just, I'm curious if he's a slave and if he loves his master. So just kidding, just kidding. All right, you don't have to turn there, but for the sake of time, I'll give you a quick paraphrase. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, we also learn a little bit more insight about someone who has indentured themselves to a master to work as their servant. And basically what happens is if they fall on hard times and they, they owe debts that they cannot pay and, and there's no other way, they didn't have bankruptcy back then. And bankruptcy is wicked, all right? And I'm not getting down on you if you've declared bankruptcy in the past, you know, but borrowing things and not repaying them is wicked, okay? And so the Bible did not have a bankruptcy court and back in the old days, and, and there was no, I'm sorry, I owe you all this money. <laughs> You're just going to have to forget about it, I guess. I'm going to go declare bankruptcy, mess up my credit score for about seven years, and then I'm just going to pick up where I left off and no problem. And sorry, I owe you all this money, but hey, whatever. So that's not cool. All these creditors, and you know, we think about, well, 
These big credit card companies, they can handle it. They, they don't bother them. You know, they're used to this. They factor all this into their, into their profit margins, and they know exactly the default rates of all their customers and clients. And, and who cares about the big, rich credit card companies? It's not just banks and credit card companies who get hurt in a bankruptcy. There are very good, hardworking people who have loaned a lot of money to family and friends and acquaintances and coworkers who get left holding the bag and, and they get burned and they, they needed that money and it happens all the time, okay? So it's not just the big bad banks and credit card companies who get burned whenever somebody defaults and declares bankruptcy. But in Deuteronomy 15, it does say that if somebody falls on hard times and they cannot repay, then what they should do is indenture themselves to the master, or to the person that they owe money to, and work it off over the next six years. Now, if they owe just a little bit, they could, be, they could satisfy their judgment in a shorter amount of time. But if they owed a very large debt of maximum penalty, it was going to take a maximum time of six years to pay it off, okay? And, and who's ever heard or seen on a TV show or a movie back in the day where somebody goes into a restaurant and they order up a whole lot of food and they owe a large bill and the waiter comes and brings them the tab, the bill, and says, your bill, your ticket is $250 tonight for you and your family. And he says, I can't pay that much. I got 50. I didn't have a, I didn't know I ordered that much food. And they end up getting in arrears with that restaurant. So the restaurant makes them go in the back, put on the apron and wash dishes for the rest of the night. Have you, have you ever heard of that? Has anybody in here ever had, had to do that? All right, Brother Ross, Miss Jennifer. All right. Both of them. Hey, they're, they're not ashamed. All right. So they fell into the trap of the restaurant. All right. So yeah, but anyways, I don't think anybody has ever done that, but that does, you know, sometimes happen, I guess. We see it in the movies back in the day. I've seen that before. And that's kind of what it is. You, you have an obligation. You can't pay it back. You need to go work it off and get right, and that's how it's supposed to be. And that's the same concept that we have in the Bible, okay? All right, and so this is... Uh, this is exactly what's prescribed by God, and it's not forever unless he wants it to be forever, unless the actual indentured servant or slave wants it to be forever. Now imagine this. Imagine somebody just on the run, living a horrible, wicked life. All of his friends and his family are the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low all of his peers, they're just putting him in the worst situation. And this kid finally gets out from underneath his parents and he goes out on his own. And he's been taught all these bad habits all of his life. He goes and he tries to get a job. He starts working for a man and, and uh, he, he gets some creditors out there. He, he's trying to make a living and then he falls on real hard times and he just buckles under the weight and he can't declare bankruptcy. So he goes and he indentures himself to a master who settles all of his debts and he says, you're, you're, you're mine for the next six years. And the Bible prescribes in, in, in uh, Deuteronomy 15 that these slaves or indentured servants are supposed to be respected. They're not supposed to be just spit upon and looked down upon, but they're supposed to be respected. They're supposed to be treated just like any other hired servant and they're supposed to be well taken care of, and they're supposed to be, you know, given all the, uh, the luxuries and, uh, that, that they're an, a regular employee could afford, and that's how they were supposed to be treated. In fact, at the end of Deuteronomy, it says, after the end of those six years, send them out full. Give them all, you know, give them, just load them down because the Lord has blessed them and blessed you for those last six years of service that they've done unto you. So don't just say, hey, thanks for your work. Uh, let me get you a few apples on the way out the door. I appreciate it. See you around. No, load them up, send them out full. And that way they get a, a new good start in their new life of being a free person again, right? Uh, but... 
They're supposed to be respected. Now, just imagine the life that that person might have come from, down and out, didn't have anything, bad peers, bad relatives, terrible home life. And they said, you know what? My life has gotten substantially better in these last six years. Like, I've been a slave or a servant for six years now, and my life has exponentially gotten better. My master gave me a wife. We have four kids now. My, I don't even want to go back to being, if that's what it was, I don't want to go back to my old life, back away from here. I just want to serve him and be a part of this new, he's my family. I look up to him like he's my father. His wife is like my mother. I want to be a part of this family. I want to stay here. And hey, he chooses on his own volition to become a slave for life. And who knows if that master would actually make him a slave. You know, you, the, can you imagine what it would be like to work for a very good Christian man? He's going to take care of you. And he's going to be like, hey, I'm not going to make you work the rest of your life. I'm going to set you free anyway. But you can stay. You can stay. And he's going to look to him more as a friend and a trusted confidant than an actual slave of his family or something like that. That's how we as Christians should be treating people as well. All right, but then they say, hey, and I'm running out of time, but they say, hey, but the Bible does condone other types of slavery besides that voluntary bond service of six years. Have you not read Leviticus chapter 25? So let's go there. Leviticus chapter 25, the Bible does condone slavery. Okay, agree, we agree. We're not disputing the fact, it does. So let's read about it. Let's find out what's going on here. Verse 39, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant. But as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. And then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his family and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shall fear thy God. So he's telling them, hey, these Israelites that are serving you, that have put themselves into their, your bond service, don't mistreat them. Don't make them serve with rigor. That's what it said about the Egyptians. When the Israelites were in, in Egypt, the Egyptians made them serve with rigor, made them you know, work very hard and crack the whip the whole time. But now look at this, verse 44. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have. He's saying you're going to have bondmen and you're going to have bondmaids. You will have them. It says, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession, and ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. Whoa. You know what that sounds like? Slavery. You know what that is? Slavery. Okay, now what was God's primary plan for the nations around Israel, the, the promised land? What, was, what did God tell his people to do to those nations? Wipe them out. Wipe them out. Utterly wipe them out. The men, the women, the children, everything, okay? He knew that wasn't going to happen. This is the next provision that he made for them, okay? So... I'm going to read, well, go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 9. 1 Kings chapter 9. Basically, God said, wipe them out. Take them out. These people are heathen. They hate me. 
they, they teach their children wicked and terrible sinful things. They believe in false gods. They are a scourge on the earth, and I think they should all be destroyed. And who are we to say, no, God, that's wrong? You're wrong, God. Not me. I'm not going to tell God he's wrong. So we should not stand in judgment of God. But he knew that was not going to happen. They tried their best, but they, they fell short, okay? So 1 Kings chapter 9, we're picking up with Solomon in verse 20. And it says, And all the people that were left of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which were not of the children of Israel, their children that were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not able utterly to destroy, upon those did Solomon levy a tribute of bond service unto this day. But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no bondmen, but they were men of war. And his servants and his princes and his captains and rulers of his chariots and his horsemen. All right. So we see that these neighboring countries, the Jebusites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, all these guys, uh, they were actually, I believe that the, the adults were probably slain and the children were taken into Israel. And they were made bondmen and bondmates. And they grew up with the Israelites. We know that in Joshua, when who was it, Gibeon, uh, uh, the people that came, they, they, they knew that the Israelites were coming. They heard and the fear of the Lord fell upon them. So they made themselves look like they took a far journey. And then once they made a league with them, then Joshua said, you're going to be our bondmen forever. We can't kill you. So the best, next best thing is you're going to be our bond servants. And that's what they were. And then King Saul, you know, a few hundred years later, King Saul ends up killing off some of those uh, Gibeonites and it angers the Lord to the point where King Saul, uh, to the point where Israel is being plagued. And when they asked God, they said, God, why are we being plagued right now? It's because of how King Saul treated these people who they were supposed to be in their care. So anyways, God still wants the, the slave, the indentured servant to be taken care of always. So we see that Solomon puts people into bondage, the ones that were around. And then you're in 1 Kings. I'm going to read for you 2 Kings. And this is a practice we see throughout the Bible. And you don't have to turn there, but in 2 Kings chapter 4, you know this story. In verse 1 it says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant my husband is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take him unto my two sons to be bondmen. They're coming to get my two sons and take them away to make them bondmen uh, and to pay off our debts. Because now I'm a widow. My husband had debts. I got to pay them. I can't pay them. They're going to take my two sons away into slavery. This is something that we see throughout the Bible. I'm not going to read you the rest of the story, but you know what happens, that wonderful miracle that Elisha tells her to perform with the oil and all the, all the vessels. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is talking. In verse 23, he says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. This was, there was no bankruptcy court anywhere in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. You had bond service. You had debtor's prison. You, you had to go and, and think about this, guys. If there was no bankruptcy laws, in this country or anywhere around the world, do you think people would be a little bit more smarter with their money? Yeah. If they said, you know what, I could sign up for this loan, but I could also end up becoming a slave if I can't pay it back. I think I'm good. I think yeah. I'm good. I'm, I'm going to be debt free. All right. So it would really make people think twice before they saddled themselves with huge burdens and debts and, and loans that they, they may or may not can pay back. All right. 
So what's the point of slavery? What's the point of that in the Bible? That's what most people should be asking themselves. Um, most commonly in the Bible, it was to pay back a debt that you occurred, a large debt obligation you would serve for six years. And number two, it was an alternative to death. All right? As an alternative to death, the prisoners of war, POWs, instead of being slain, they would be taken and placed into a bond service and they would work. And, and just think now, um, people that are actually brought into from a heathen nation, God says you're going to bring them from a heathen nation. What does heathen mean? They know not the Lord. They do not follow God. They don't fear the Lord. These are uh, totally anti-God. They're taken from that environment and put into a righteous nation, one that fears God. What do you think their generations, these slaves, these, these indentured servants, generations and generations down the road, do you think they're going to hold to their pagan practices or do you think they're going to adopt the religion of, of, the, of their captors, of their masters? Well, we have a case study here in America. And in America... 97% of black Americans are a Christian. 3% are atheists, all right? And 3% are atheists or other religion is what it says. That's uh, according to a Pew Research poll recently. 97% uh, identify as Christian. Now, we know Christians, big umbrella. It can be Catholic, it can be Muslim, oh, not Muslim, <laughs> Methodist, it can be Baptist, it can be uh, all these Methodists, whatever. But 97% agree with Christians. That is their preferred religion of choice. So was that right, bringing the Africans into this country as slaves? What do y'all think? No. No, it was not. Um, it was not. The, the, uh, the thing says, uh, I'm sorry, it says Exodus 21, 16. And he that stilleth a man and selleth him, or if he had been found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. All right? And so not only that, you're not supposed to steal a man. And, I, and people argue all the time. They say, it wasn't the white man that went into Africa and stole them. It was the Africans who end up you know, stealing their own Africans, and then they sold them to the white man. Well, then you're found in his hand, okay? So it's not, the, it's, not, it's not because the white man went on a crusade to cleanse Africa and to make it a Christian nation, and they're prisoners of war, and they're taking them. That's not exactly what happened. They just went and slave traded. They purchased these slaves and brought them to this country. Notice all the Native Americans. Has anyone ever heard of a Native American slave? No. The white man didn't come over here and find a whole bunch of heathens because that's what they were. That's what they are, okay? They didn't just come over here and find a whole bunch of heathens and say, all right, they're all, we're going to just take them as our slaves. You know, we got advanced firepower. We got the dominant force. We're going to just enslave all these Native Americans, these Indians. No, that did not happen, okay? So... Uh, the mistreatment of slaves. And I understand not all slave owners mistreated their slaves. And this is one of my last points. I'm wrapping it up, I promise. Once you mistreat your slave, you are in jeopardy of losing them according to the Bible. You're supposed to treat them with dignity and respect and take care of them and provide for them. It says in Exodus 21, 16, and he... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to paraphrase, but it says that if you smite his eye and his eye be cast out, then you shall let him go for his eye's sake. And if you knock out one of his teeth, you should let him go for his tooth's sake. So you're not going to mistreat and beat up and abuse these people who are providing for you. You're going to take care of them, provide for them. And that's how it was supposed to be. But bankruptcy is legalized theft. It should not be part of our laws. And the last place I want to go to, I want to show you that, oh, the, the, the trap is coming down the pulpit at me. All right, it's coming down. Uh, don't follow me. All right. First Corinthians chapter 7, guys. We're going we're gonna to finish up right there. First Corinthians chapter 7. 
I want to show you that we're all slaves. And the Bible doesn't use the word slave. It used the word servant, okay? But in this context we're about to read, you can, you can replace it with slave. That's exactly what it means. And it, and it shows the free man in the contrast. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verse 21. The Bible says, Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So if you found yourself being a bondman in this world in 2024, think not of it. Care not of it. Hey, serve that master just like you're serving Christ. And if you find yourself being a free man, which I think that applies to just about everybody in this country, then you are Christ's bondsman and you should serve him directly. And you got the freedom to do so. And so you are a slave to somebody, whether it's your master on the earth or your master in heaven, but we should serve him. And it's kind of like the sermon that Pastor Fannin preached just recently on addictions. We should be addicted to the ministry of Jesus Christ and serve God just like as if we were uh, addicted to this ministry. We should be really, and we should not say, I know I'm supposed to be serving God like a servant of, to him, but instead I'm going to serve my television. Instead I'm going to serve my vices and my alcohol and my other drugs that are taking me away from this great calling. We should put all these things aside and chase after God and that's all I got, and I uh, thank you for your time. Let's pray, and uh, we'll be dismissed after we sing. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to get to preach tonight, Lord, and um, hope we got to get the message across clearly without uh, uh, confusing anyone and that the message went into their ears and down into their hearts and that they were able to think and dwell on these things. And God, we ask that you please just continue to speak to us through your word. And God, we just love you so much. Please protect us as we leave tonight and bless our uh, time of celebration in the back. And we love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.